You guys can be seated. Uh, this next set of songs we're going to do, um, all, all of them are just going to lead us into a time of communion. And uh, with these with these songs, really, they focus on the, the, the heart of um, well, our hearts uh, when it comes to why we celebrate communion, why we remember uh, the Lord's Supper each week. And we, we do that in recognition of what Jesus did uh, on the cross. The fact that uh, we were, you know, sinful people, we were broken people, and it was through his goodness and through his greatness, uh, his willingness to obey his Father's will, that uh, that he endured the cross, and through it, because of his blood, our sins could be washed away. Um, we could live in relationship with God, and uh, we can have the hope of eternal life. And so these next uh, few songs are just lead us into that that heart of recognition um i'm not sure about you but when when someone sacrifices for me it, it uh it kind of stirs me when we recognize the the depth and the value of what jesus sacrificed for you and for for me um we should be s stirred to, to sing and, and praise him and so that's kind of what what these songs you know talk about is just god's goodness his greatness and then eventually his sacrifice which we celebrate through the Lord's Supper. And so uh, today, if you're, you're visiting with us after the songs, there'll be a slide that kind of directs you when to, to uh, take the bread and the juice. Um, most of you here this morning know when to do that. But um, during these songs, just prepare your heart and mind and, and really think about all that Jesus did uh, to, to help us uh, just break the, the bonds of sin in our life.
Father in heaven, we just come to you right now and we, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your willingness to obey your Father's will. And Jesus, we, we thank you for, um, although death on the cross wasn't something you looked forward to, um, it was something you lovingly endured to accomplish your Father's will and to provide a way for us to, to live in relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray that as we live our lives, as we take time each week to remember your sacrifice, I pray that you also help us remember the example that you set. Um, there's so much more that we can learn from you than just looking at what you did on the cross, which was an amazing thing. Uh, just looking at your life and how you lived in love and in sacrifice on a daily basis, putting the needs of others in front of your own, uh, taking opportunities to, to make a difference, stopping for people who are marginalized and forgotten about, uh, and you see them, Lord, and, and you love them, and, and you meet their needs. And Lord, I pray that you know, when we remember your sacrifice on the cross, that we remember your sacrifice in life as well. And Lord, I pray that as Christians, that we would truly be followers of you, that we would emulate your life, that we would, we would see people who are who are marginalized by society, people who are forgotten about, people who are in, in need, um, people who are in pain, people who are desperate, people who others have a tendency to overlook. Lord, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and hearts to respond to those type of people in our lives. God, you are so good and you've blessed us in so many ways. Um, thank you for reminding us of your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for giving us your word, which allows us to understand your purpose and our purpose in life. And Lord, I pray that, that you would give us the courage and the boldness to, to listen to your word and to follow your leading, to be the people that you want us to be. But we know that it was Jesus on the cross that provides the way for us to even have the opportunity. So thank you for all you've done. We pray that you continue to be with us, continue to watch over us, continue to guide us. And all these things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Now this time we'll dismiss our children for their, their class. And we'll, uh, I guess we'll get started with the message then. As many of you know, we've been working our way through a sermon series um, that is entitled uh, Ascend. I better put my glasses on this morning. And uh, actually, I have a Father's Day present for, uh, for all the fathers. Robin looked at my notes and was like, man, this is a short sermon. I was like, hey, it's Father's Day. What b better gift could I give fathers? Let them out early. Let them get to their lunch or whatever they're going to do. So that's my intent. That, that's my intent. And no promises, but that's my intent this morning. We're in the middle of this sermon series entitled Ascend, and if you've been with us, you know what Ascend, uh, Ascend is a sermon series focusing on the songs or the Psalms of Ascent found in Psalms 120 through 134. There are 15 specific Psalms that uh, were used. It was a collection of diverse songs that were written for God's people to sing and to meditate on as they uh, traveled together. Sometimes they were traveling as individuals, but most, most of the time they were tra traveling as family units, uh, and they would sing these songs together, preparing their hearts for worship as they would head to Jerusalem and head up the, the mountain that Jerusalem was built on, thus the title Songs of Ascent. Um, it probably had a dual meaning. First of all, um, they were going up in elevation, but also it was meant to help prepare their hearts and minds for worship, and so it focused them on a higher level, a higher place. And so uh, that's kind of the idea of the Psalms of Ascent or the Songs of Ascent, however you want to say it. But if you remember back last Sunday, I mentioned that scholars believe that these 15 songs uh, are divided into five triads, five groups of three. And last week, uh, we finished the third Psalm, which was, it ended the first triad. And I just want you to, to, to recognize the progression that you see in the first three songs, because in Psalm 120, where it began, the, it, the psalmist who wrote that one mentioned that they were from uh, places like Kedar and uh, Meshach, and uh, these people, essentially, whether it was figurative language or literal language, whether they were literally in those places or 
among pagan people. Um, some scholars believe that it was just a metaphor for, hey, when you're outside of the, the nation of Israel and you're living among pagan people, or maybe you're, you know, you're just surrounded by pagan people where you're at in, in Israel, he's like, hey, you have a long journey ahead of you is, is what it was all about. It was like, hey, journeying from this pagan place to this holy city and, and the, the progression, the pilgrimage that you would take. Psalm 120 focuses on the, the desperation of the psalmist, the, the, pro, the trials and difficulties that he was facing in these evil cities or evil locations. And it focuses on the, the need to, to move forward uh, to the city of Jerusalem. Psalm 121, the next one, uh, the psalmist finds himself at the foot of the hill that Jerusalem is built on. And he's, his, his opening line is, I look to the hills, where does my help come from? Or some translations say mountains. I look to the mountains, and where does my help from, come from? And it was, it was literally the psalmist would be standing uh, outside of the city, looking up this, to the city that's on this mountain, on this hill, and he's, he's kind of proclaiming, hey, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And he goes on to talk about the fact that, you know, God has blessed him in so many ways. And so that's another transition we see in, in between Psalm 120 and 121. You know, there was proximity, like one was, you know, outside, far away from Jerusalem. The Psalm 121 was standing at the foot of Jerusalem, looking up into the city, seeing the city, asking, where does my help come from? Recognizing the temple of God's there. God's presence is at the temple. So he's acknowledging, hey, this is where my help, my help comes from the Lord who's in Jerusalem. So there's a proximity issue there. Um, and then another transition we see between 120 and 121 is the fact that in 120, the psalmist focuses on his difficulties. In 121, he begins to focus on his blessings. Both of them look to God to be the, the, the resolution of these difficulties. Because both difficulties are mentioned in Psalm 120 and 121. But instead of focusing on the difficulties that in Psalm 120 is done, in 121, he switches gears he has this proximity to Jerusalem, this proximity to, to, to God, and now he's just, you know, he's aside. I, hey, I'm going through difficult times, but I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. And he begins just to focus on the fact that, that God's going to bless him. 123, or 122, last week we looked at uh, the, the next step in this transition. And in 122, we find the psalmist is now standing in the city of Jerusalem. So it's from far away to close by, to actually literally in the city of Jerusalem, and um, he begins to worship there. And so 123, uh, what we see taking place in Psalm 123 is um, the fact that uh, just because the, the worshipers, and, and the, these, these songs were written in a progression, meant to be sung in a particular order. Just because they have reached Jerusalem doesn't mean all their problems have vanished. Just because they're in close proximity to God now, you know, his presence is in Jerusalem at the temple, just because they're in a close proximity to God does not mean their problems cease to exist. All their problems are not solved. Um, but in Psalm 123, the psalmist does express a knowledge and a certainty of who he's going to turn to in the midst of the difficulties in his life. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the overarching theme of 123. That just because we're in a close, I mean, as we apply to ourselves, just because we're in a close proximity to God doesn't mean that our problems cease to exist. But we can have a knowledge and a certainty of who we can turn to and look to in those difficult times. And so if you have your Bible with you this morning, I'm gonna encourage you to, to uh, turn to Psalm 123. If you're not already there, if you don't have your Bible, um, you can look on the screen, it'll be, um, it may not be up there, I'm not sure. Uh, it will be later, but uh, right now I'm gonna ask Susie if she can uh, read Psalm 123, one through four for us. I lift up my eyes to you, to you whose throne is in heaven. As the eyes of a slave look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of their mistress, so our eyes, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we have endured much contempt. We have endured much ridicule from the proud and much contempt from the arrogant. Okay, here, in, once again, here in Psalm 120, the worshipers sing about times of trials and difficulties. Now, I want you to recognize something. It's an important lesson that we need to learn from this passage, and that is, and I mentioned it before, even 
in circumstances where we feel God is close to us and we feel his you know, powerful presence in our lives does not mean that all our problems will go away. It doesn't mean that you know, he's gonna miraculously you know, remove us from all difficulties or all trials in our lives. That's not gonna happen. And this Psalm kind of reinforces that thought. And so today as we work through this Psalm, the, the basic question I want to answer, I, I just kinda wanna look at one question and I want us to answer this question by the time we end. And that is, what does this Psalm teach us about dealing with trials and difficulties in our lives? All right, what does this psalm teach us about trials and difficulties in our lives? And, th- and there's four short verses, and there's just two things I want to point out this morning. So if you can sit with me through these two things, I think you're going to go away uh, with an idea of how to deal with, with difficulties in your life. Um, and once again, probably this isn't something that's like earth shattering in the fact that it's some, some new concept or new idea. This is just meant to reinforce probably what you already know and hopefully what you already do. Okay, and that's what these Psalms of Ascent were. They, they, these individuals would every year, three times a year, they would have to go to Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts. And every year they would use these Psalms of Ascent to remind them to prepare their hearts, to prepare their minds for, for truly honoring and worshiping God. And so that's what we want to do today as well. And so let's jump right in and look at what the Psalm teaches us about dealing with trials and difficulties in our lives. I think we would all agree that uh, at different times in our lives, we all face trials and difficulties. I mean, it's, it's a universal thing. We all have difficult times that we have to go through. Um, probably one of the reasons that trials and difficulties is mentioned so much in God's word, both Old Testament and New Testament, is the fact that this is like a universal experience that all of us have gone through difficulties. As a matter of fact, chances are many of us here today are probably in the midst of some sort of difficulty right now. We live in a broken world. We're broken people. We have broken people around us. And so sometimes we say things or do things that hurt others. And other times people say things and do things with us. Sometimes it's circumstantial. Sometimes it's health issues. Sometimes it's financial issues. We have all kinds of trials and difficulties that we have to face. And so in the midst of that, we need to understand that there is someone we can look to, someone we can turn to, to, to kind of help with that. You know, when we think about the Psalms of Ascent, what we've talked about so far Three of the first four songs of ascent deal specifically with trials and difficulties in the lives of the worshipers. So this obviously was a common theme that they had to to deal with. Many of the things that we've looked at so far have been relational in nature. Like saying, hey, it's because the people that I'm around that I have trials and difficulties in my life. And maybe that's the case for you. Maybe it's in in your work environment or you have a problem with a neighbor or maybe in in a... you know, community group you're in, maybe even in the church or maybe in your family. Like I said before, we are broken people. We live in a broken world. And so difficulties come in our lives. Very common theme, the songs of ascent, three of the first four songs that we've looked at so far deal with dealing with difficulties in our lives. And when it comes to why it's so important to, to be able to deal with trials and difficulties in our lives, Uh, I I believe that oftentimes how we deal with trials and difficulties can be defining moments in our life. How how we deal with trials and difficulties really can shape the direction that we're going. It can either uh, either propel us forward, you know, as we deal with, I mean, James talks about the fact that we're supposed to consider these difficulties pure joy because they help us mature in our faith. They can be a catalyst for us to grow. Our difficulties can be a catalyst for us to to grow in our relationship or our knowledge of God or grow in our faith. Just being willing to trust in God and and watch him work in our lives can be catalyst for growth or it can be a stumbling block for us. You know, how we deal with difficulties are defining moments in our lives. Not only for ourselves, they're defining moments for other people as they're watching us because, you know, as others see us going through difficult times, they can see what our faith is really made of. Is it, is it made of something solid that, hey, when the storm comes, when, when the wind and rain beat against us, are we going to stand or are we going to crumble? And so how we deal with trials and difficulties is really important for our own spiritual walk and for the walk of others who are watching around us can be very important. And so I want you to understand that just the, the necessity for us to be able to deal with trials and difficulties in a positive way. 
So once again, the question I want to talk about is what does this psalm teach us about dealing with trials and difficulties in our lives? And the first thing I want to point out is that it directs us to turn to God. It directs us to turn to God. In verses 1 and 2, we can see the worshipers singing about their dependence on God. In verse 1, they sing, I lift up my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. Here, the worshipers begin recognizing God's position, okay? If you're taking notes, you can write that down. You know, God's position is very important. They, they focus on that, the first thing. I don't know if you remember back the first three psalms we looked at. The first line of the song was so important. It set the tone for the rest of the song. And so in this one, the, the psalmist, the writer, points to God's position as of primary importance, that God is the one who sits enthroned in heaven. The imagery is God sitting on a throne, and it acknowledges both the fact that he is, he is both Lord and King. Okay? Such an important concept. We, we think about king. We all kind of know what a king is. A king is, a, you know, a, an authority, a, a ruler. Lord, same concept, this idea of Lord uh, is, is someone who is master over everyone beneath him. And so when, when they refer to God in his position as sitting on a throne, it recognizes his power and his authority in their lives. And so as we think about this psalm, as we think about this song as it relates to us, that we have to acknowledge, do we believe that God is sitting on the throne? Do we, do we see, do we look up and, and see God in his power, in his authority, in our own lives? The fact that his throne is in heaven acknowledges that he's transcendent. He's above all of us. We, we, we like to think of this idea of God being very eminent with us, and that's true. He is both transcendent and eminent, but, but the Israelites here, the, the psalmist right here indicates, hey, God is seated on a throne in heaven. He is above all of our problems. He is above all of our issues. He's above all the authority here on earth. He's, a, he's above everything. He's in heaven. We're on earth. He is divine. We are not. And it's an, impo- it's an important concept for us to wrap our minds around the fact that God is above all, seated on a throne in heaven. You know, considering his position, instead of telling God how big our problems are, maybe we should remind ourselves how big our God is. Because that is, in fact, what the Israelite, that what the psalmist is doing right here. He says, I lift my eyes to you who sit enthroned in heaven. It's just a reminder that, that God is Lord and King, and he is above all of us. If we look at verse 2, the worshipers continue by singing this. They sing, as the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. And so initially in, in the psalm, the psalmist points to God's position, and then he shifts gears to, to our position. You know, our position is, in relation to God's position. And they recognize that God is seated on the throne. They also recognize that their place is beneath him. And what they liken it to is uh, liken it to a master and a slave where the master provides for the slave. And when we think about our relationship with God, sometimes we like to think of ourselves in, in a very independent way. We like to think of our, our own abilities and skills or our own bank accounts or our own, you know, houses. We think these things are our things that we've done for ourselves and we've made a name for ourselves and, and we are self-made people. The Israelites were like, no, we, we're just slaves. We're just servants with God seated on a throne in heaven as Lord and King. And, it, and it's by his grace by his goodness, by his blessing that we have what we have. This is something they simply acknowledge in the first two verses of this psalm. They acknowledge God's position. They acknowledge their own position. In verse 2, it is a kind of metaphorical way of acknowledging that God is God, and we are not. That, that God is master And we are not, that God is on a throne and we are not. And and we look to him because he is the one who is in control of all things and we are not. And that's 
hard for some of us to let go of. That's hard for some of us to, to wrap our minds around, that, that we are not in control because we like to be in control. And some, some of us are control freaks, and if, and if we feel like things are slipping out of control, we have anxiety attacks and panic attacks, and, and we get worried and stressed and frustrated and angry at times because we feel like control is slipping through our fingers. And that's just a false narrative right there. We've never had control. We don't have a control of, of how many days we live. We don't have control over anything. Ultimately, God is in control, and we need to acknowledge that he's seated on a throne in heaven. He's Lord, and he's king, and we are simply his servants, blessed by his goodness, blessed by his grace, blessed by his mercy. Far too often, we find ourselves in situations, and we simply forget this principle that that God is God, and we are not. Like I said before, we like to be in control, and so when we forget that simple principle, we find ourselves, you know, frustrated and upset and angry because what we thought we were in control of is not happening like we want it to. And so sometimes we try to control other people. Sometimes we try to control situations. And when things don't work out like we want, we lose it. And, you know, it can wreck our day or wreck our week because we feel like, hey, you know, I'm supposed to be in control here. And, and I really, we, you know, slowly recognize sometimes that we are not in control. And so if we would just remember this principle that God is God and God is in control and we are not God and we are not in control, if we can just remember that principle, it can help our lives be so much better. It's not that we need to be, you know, apathetic. It's not that we don't care about, you know, what happens. You know, we're still going to be involved, but we need to, to lay our, our situations, our difficulties, our trials. We need to lay our lives at the feet of Jesus and say, you are Lord, you are King, help me live my life according to your plan. Because oftentimes what we do is we go to God and say, hey God, this is my plan, bless my plan. But if we truly believe God is transcendent and God is Lord and King and he's above all things and nothing is, you know, outside of the realm of his authority, then wouldn't it be smarter for us to say, hey God, help me see your plan. Give me the wisdom, give me the strength, give me the power to live according to your plan, instead of trying to tell him, God, bless my plan, as if our plan is better than his. You know, recognizing both God's position and our position is the beginning of wisdom when it comes to dealing with difficulties in our lives. And so that leads us to the second point I want to get at this, this morning, the, I want to, the second part of answering this question, what does this psalm teach us about dealing with trials and difficulties in our lives? The first one is we need to turn to God. You know, they, they turned and they looked at, at God seated in the throne, but then we need to trust in God. There's a significant shift that takes place in between verses 1 and 2 and verses 3 and 4. And I want you to recognize that. Uh, in, in verses 1 and 2, the psalmist is acknowledging God, uh, God's position of power and authority. In verses 3 and 4, the psalmist moves beyond simply acknowledging God's position and begins to turn to him and to trust him, and he begins to, to approach God in prayer. You know, prayer is kind of an act of faith. So when we, we see, we, we say initially, I believe in God. I believe God has power. I believe God has authority. I believe God can help. Prayer is when we act on that belief. And that's what faith is. Faith is having this belief and being, being willing to act on it. And so he begins with turning to God. But in verses 3 and 4, he begins to trust God. And he begins to talk to God about the trials and, and the difficulties in his life. Listen to what the psalmist writes. Listen to what the worshipers sing in verses 3 and 4. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. For we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured... No end of ridicule from the arrogant, of contempt from the proud. And so here, the worshipers sing about the predicament that they're in. First, they acknowledge God's position. They acknowledge their position. Now they're approaching God. They've turned to him. They're trusting in him and helping them in the predicament they find themselves in. And, and that is just the object of scorn by those around him. And we can speculate on to, you know, what specific event the psalmist might be writing about um, or what he was originally referring to when he wrote the psalm. But what we do know is that it appears 
that the psalmist is finding himself once again, and we saw this in the, the first, in Psalm 120, the first song of ascent, finds himself in a situation that's outside the realm of his control. That there's really nothing he can do about it. And so he seeks God, like, hey, the, the arrogant, the proud, they're all around me. They're, they're scornful. They're, they hold me in contempt. Um, you know, they ridicule me. Really, we can't control what other people say or do to us. And so the psalmist is just recognizing that, and he's turning to God. One of life's biggest and hardest lessons is realizing that there will be times in our lives that we can't do anything about the problems that we are facing. It can be really frustrating when we find difficulties in our lives that we can't do anything about. Like there's nothing we can do about it. And during those times in our lives, the quicker we come to this realization that there's nothing that we can do about it, the quicker we usually turn to God. When we, when we recognize, hey, th this situation here is out of my control, hopefully that motivates us or pushes us to turn to, to the one who can help, to turn to God. True wisdom is realizing that God has and, and never will leave us or forsake us, and, and God has the ability and the authority to do uh, whatever he wants to in all circumstances. But going back to what he initially talked about, when we forget God's position and we forget our position, and we try to accomplish everything on our own, it, it's really the, the pinnacle of foolishness. When we uh, kind of fall back into the habit of what we did before we came to understand who God is in our lives, fall back into the habit of, of trying to take care of things on our own. That's kind of our natural, uh, honestly, that's kind of our natural reflex. You know, something bad happens, what can I do to fix it? You know, there's, there's a broken relationship, what can I do to fix it? You know, your marriage has problems. What can I do to fix it? You have a problem with one of your, your children. What can I do to fix it? And, and we should be active in working on it. But you know what our first step should be? It's not, it's not trusting in our own wisdom, in our own intelligence, on in our own power, in our own, you know, authority, on our own finances. It's, it's not trusting in ourselves. Our first instinct should be, let me turn to God. Let me go to him. Let me ask for his guidance. Let me ask for his wisdom. Let me ask for his blessing. Let me ask for his perspective on what I should do and trust that he is aware and he cares enough to reveal his will to us in our lives. You see, at the heart of this psalm is a lesson about prayer. And in this psalm, we can see that prayer, uh, in prayer we focus on God and not only on just our problems. We in prayer, we express our helplessness, like, hey, there, there are things outside the realm of our control, and we need you. In, in prayer, we submit to God. And then ultimately, in prayer, we cry out to God for mercy. You see, when it comes to dealing with trials and difficulties in our lives, and the importance of approaching God in prayer, the psalmist is clear about what he is seeking. He is seeking God's mercy. That's, that's what he's calling out for. That's what he's crying out for. He's call, crying out for God's mercy. Now, growing up in the South, uh, there was a phrase that I would hear almost every day, all right? And maybe, maybe Ohioans say it as well. I'm not sure. You guys can help me out here. But uh, almost on a daily basis, I would hear this phrase, Lord, have mercy. Anyone say, Lord, have mercy? Let, let, me, uh, let me tell you the context that I would hear it in, okay? So... Uh, typically, I would most, most of the time, I, I grew up in Virginia Beach, but most of the time, well, a lot of times we were in North Carolina with all my family. And so the context is I would be there uh, with my family around, and then I would say something, and I would do something, and whoever was standing around would just look at me, and they would shake their head, and they would say, Lord, have mercy. And then they would turn and walk away, shaking their head like, oh, my God. I, at the time, I didn't appreciate those little prayers for me, all right? And I see them as little prayers like, Lord, if you don't step in, if you don't do something with this child, I, I honestly don't know what's going to happen to him. And I'm going to give credit to all those little prayers I heard on a daily basis for helping me become the person I am today and having the beautiful family that I have today. 
Um, but the reality is we all need God's mercy. It's a, it's a prayer that I pray more, um, more often than not. It's a simple prayer. I pray, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on my life. Lord, have mercy on my family. Lord, have mercy on my community and my country. And Lord, have mercy on the world that we're living in. We are broken people in need of God's mercy, in need of God's grace. And it's amazing what, the, what a simple prayer, seeking the mercy of God, God who is seated on a throne in heaven above all things, in control of all things, and we turn to him recognizing his goodness, recognizing his authority, recognizing his greatness, and we turn to him and say, God, have mercy on me because I can't fix it on my own. I can't do it on my own. I can't live my life on my own. We can try and we can fail. But the reality is, and what we learn from this psalm is this simple fact, that God is God and we are not. That God has authority that we don't have. That he is in control when we are not. And so a simple prayer, Lord have mercy, might seem like a slight in some ways. And, and you know, the shaking of the head wasn't very encouraging. But let me tell you something. There's nothing more blessed than being prayed for. And knowing and acknowledging that God is who he says he is. And he knows us and he loves us. And he wants to show his mercy to us. When it comes to God's mercy, we experience his mercy when he intercedes for us and prevents us from experiencing what we would normally experience apart from him. That's when we experience God's mercy. And, and unfortunately for us, because God is a merciful God, at times we don't even recognize his mercy being poured into our lives because he prevents things from happening to us that normally would if he did not intercede. And so we don't, we don't know what our lives would look like if we didn't experience his mercy because we're not there. It's because of his mercy that we're in the situations that we're in, because of his mercy that we've survived some of the things that we should not have survived. You know, the, the relational issues that should have wrecked us or the financial issues that should have wrecked us or, or, you know, maybe physical issues, health issues that could have wrecked us. We don't know where we would have been without the mercy of God because we're in a different place. The psalmist they, they're in proximity with God, but they still recognize there are going to be trials and difficulties in their life that they need, they desperately need God and his mercy in their lives. And so that's essentially what these, first, uh, these four verses are talking about, is acknowledging difficulties in life and seeking God's mercy because he's the one they need to turn to. You know, as we wrap things up this morning, the praise team can, can come back up and we're going we're gonna to close our service but as we, as we close our service this morning, let me just encourage you with this thought. Although in our lives we, we might and we will experience various trials and difficulties, maybe you feel like your life is filled with trials and difficulties right now, and, and so maybe you feel like, hey, I, I'm kind of over my head right now. And, and, you know, it's not a fun place to be, but it's a place that we can survive. Not because of, of how smart you are, not because of how good you are, not because of, of the connections that you have, not because of your financial account, not because of anything like that, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God. As we recognize uh, so quickly that, you know, a, a trial or difficulty is coming, we need to just as quickly recognize there's a God who knows you, a God who's aware, and a God who wants to be involved. And so my hope is, that as we work our way through these songs of ascent, as we begin to think about the context of all of these songs, that it would help remind us of that God and help remind us of his love for us. And so today, as we, as we close, if, if there's a decision you need to make today, if you need to, to, to take a step closer to him and in your relationship with him, I want to encourage you to, to come as we, as we sing this closing song, and, and I'll meet you down front um, as soon as the song is done. Um, but many of you have already accepted Christ as your Savior, and maybe you feel this, this proximity to God that, hey, I'm, I'm close with him. But even in the midst of that, I want you to you recognize where the psalmist, where these worshipers were. I mean, they, they felt like, hey, we are, we, are, we are just outside of the temple of God. I mean, God is right there, but there are still trials. There are still difficulties in my life that I need his help with. Don't confuse proximity with God with relationship with God. 
We need to live in relationship with him, trusting him. We need to turn to him and trust in him as we face the difficulties of life. Why don't you stand as we prepare to sing this closing song? Father in heaven, we come before you today and we thank you. We thank you for your presence in our life. We thank you for just knowing that you know us and, and are aware of us and care for us even before we ask. But the amazing thing is, Lord, that you want us to talk to you. You want us to, to live in relationship with you and you want us to trust in you. And even though you're a, aware of our needs before we ask, Lord, you want us to approach you um, and share those with you. Lord, uh, I, I pray that uh, we never think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. I pray that we, we never uh, see you as, you know, someone that we can just turn to in difficult times, but we can take care of our lives in, in other times. Lord, help us live in relationship with you. Help us live dependently upon you. Help us seek your, your guidance in good times and bad. And Lord, I pray that our lives would truly honor you. And that's the only way that it will, Lord. If, if we trust in you and we follow your will, your plan for our lives, uh, throughout our life, not just in, in difficult times or not just temporarily when we feel like we need you. Lord, let us be truly your people. Let us be members of your kingdom. Let us be your body. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the example that he set for us. And, and Lord, help us live like him. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone, hope you have a great week this week. Fathers out there, hope you have a great Father's Day, and we'll see you.